What's the point? Sometimes I find myself asking this question in all of the work that I engage in. Seems like a good question to revisit from time to time. Today we are going to dive into looking at expert learners. Welcome back to the Ideas in Practice strand, Module 3, Purposeful Learners. Over the next several modules, we will explore each of the key descriptors of expert learners. Expert learners are purposeful, motivated, resourceful, knowledgeable, strategic, and goal-directed. Let's start with purpose. So what is the point? As teachers, we are preparing students for a great diversity of future lives of work and citizenship, some of which no one can even anticipate. New technology and changes in the world of work lead to constantly evolving jobs. Our role in preparing young people for this future world must also evolve away from preparing for specific roles toward ensuring well-developed skills, meaningful content knowledge, grounded self-knowledge, and a sense of how all of this might add up to a future life. Let's take a step back and share a little about our own purpose. Why are you doing what you're doing? Why did you become an educator? How did you end up here? As an educator, what are you hoping to accomplish? When in your professional practice do you feel most connected to your own professional purpose? What's going on when you feel that connection? Pause here and write a brief professional purpose statement. Here are a couple ways you could start your statement. Then have a conversation with colleagues about why you became an educator. You can share your purpose statement or not. All right, welcome back. In this module, we're going to explore four questions related to developing purposeful learners. Why share clear goals? Why offer learners choice? Why work with students to co-design goals, learning experiences, and assessment? Why ask students to engage in self-assessment and self-reflection? My thought when I see a very focused, purposeful learner is, that's nice, but how do we get all students there? I think it's one step at a time. So imagine a continuum of practice regarding learning goals, with one end centered around teacher ownership and the other around student ownership. The continuum of practice outlines steps that we can take to develop the learning expertise of our students. The goal would be step by step to move from the teacher-centered end of the continuum of practice to the student-centered end. First, clarify the goal for yourself. Separate the means and the outcome. Next, share the goal clearly with students. Then, have students restate the goal in their own words. Work with students to co-construct a goal. Work with students to co-design a learning experience based on a goal. And finally, have students self-assess and reflect on their progress toward a goal. Where each of us is on this continuum varies with context. In a math lesson, you might be further along than in social studies, or it might vary with different classes. Take a moment to assess yourself in a couple of different contexts. Share this with your colleagues and talk about what it would take to take the next step forward in your practice. Your team's here to support you. Remember that. So go for it. Share your struggles. Pause here and discuss. Okay, let's start working our way up the continuum and think about how each of these practices contributes to purposeful learning. Let's start with clarifying the goal for yourself and separating the means and the outcome, the how and the what of the goal. This immediately makes the goal more accessible to a broader range of students. This practice also guides you to identify resources, curate materials, and imagine new options for students to reach a goal. Educational thinker Robert Major did early work on sharing instructional objectives with students. He said, if you give each learner a copy of your objectives, you may not have to do much else. This defines one end of the spectrum of how educators see learners. There were even experimental studies done by Glenn Hastings to confirm this rather radical statement. 
In his experiment, he gave specific instructional objectives and access to resources to one set of students, and a traditional lecture to another group. The group with the instructional objectives and no lecture performed better in a post-test on their knowledge of the content. A key step, they decided when they were ready to take the test. However, these were graduate students who presumably have already achieved a certain depth of expert learning. Most of our learners are not there yet and need our support to get there, but this does give us a vision for what expert and purposeful learning might look like when fully realized. As we take another step along our progression towards student ownership of learning, let's think about why we would share the goal with students and help them articulate the goal in their own words. Right now, there are often many reasons that we teachers remain firmly in the driver's seat, including developmental readiness, assessment pressures, and systemic expectations. If, for right now, you are firmly in the driver's seat of the instructional bus, learners at least deserve to know where the bus is going. On the other end of the spectrum from Robert Major, we could imagine the authoritarian educator who says, you have to listen to me, the teacher, because I said so. If the goal is to create expert, adaptive learners, this approach short circuits all of the opportunities for learners to exercise their decision-making skills. Somewhere in the middle is the idea that articulating goals has an orienting and organizing effect. Researcher Paul Merrill, in an experimental study designed to test the impact of sharing learning objectives with students, concluded that objectives have orienting and organizing effects which dispose students to attend to, process, and structure relevant information in accordance with the given objectives. In short, sharing a goal helps students pay attention to the right information. If you know where the bus is going, you can settle in and imagine a happy life at your destination. If at the next level, students participate in creating goals, creating learning activities and assessments that are exciting and meaningful to them, they have a new kind of emotional investment in the result of their work. If further, it is situated in a project, class, or school effort that students care about, they can begin to see why learning a particular skill or body of knowledge might be useful. Imagine projects like measuring the amount of food waste in the cafeteria or the total paper used across the school each week. Learners can, over time, take their place in the driver's seat of their own learning, developing their own goals when in a situation like this that makes sense to them. When they start making decisions about their own learning, they might make bad ones. So, how do we help them make wise decisions about their learning? Let's take a quick detour into neuroscience. For thousands of years, we have conceived of emotion and reason as opposing forces doing battle for control of our minds, behavior, and action. In recent years, with the development of neuroscience, our view of the role of emotion in decision-making has become much more subtle. Neuroscientists, on the search for situations that involve clear decision-making, where clear rules can be applied to determine the best outcome, of course, landed on gambling. In one experiment, they compared people with damage to their prefrontal cortex and those with no damage. They were given four stacks of cards to choose from. Stacks A and B offered a reward of $100 for each card flipped over. Stacks C and D offered $50 per card flipped, but there were penalty cards scattered in all of the stacks that made you lose money. But there were more penalty cards in stacks A and B, which meant that you ended up losing money in the long term. The participants didn't know this. The scientists observed their behavior and measured how sweaty their hands were, a typical response to stress and a measure neuroscientists use often. In the beginning, nobody had sweaty hands because they were getting free money. Once they started getting penalties, they started to sweat. Now here's the key. They also started to prefer the less risky piles, the $50 piles, after only 10 card flips, 
long before they could say why they were choosing them. Most figured out the rule after about 50 card flips, but 30% of participants never figured it out. But they still chose cards from the less risky, lower reward pile, even without knowing why. Their emotional reaction was influencing their decision making and behavior, even without being fully conscious of it. What about our participants with prefrontal cortex damage? They had no sweaty palm response and continued to choose the higher immediate reward decks with more penalties. An emotional response, as shown by a physical response, is literally guiding the hand of participants to make certain choices. So what? How does this affect our classroom? With so many conscious and unconscious pulls and tugs on all of our actions, it's a wonder that any of us get anything done. So to me, these kinds of results illuminate why we need a clear purpose for learning experiences that is understood and shared by learners. The power of our emotional responses guides our behavior and decision making. In the absence of feeling compelling reasons to engage, learners are left without a rudder to steer their learning. Clarifying our goals and working closely with students to find ways to connect each individual student's sense of purpose to these goals is an ongoing process and provides a reason for students to engage. Finally, as learners start to make decisions about their approach to learning and their learning goals, we must facilitate ongoing conversations about what's working and what's not. They need to assess their own learning and then they need to have active partnerships with their teachers and peers to receive feedback. By constantly engaging in this process step by step, they will start to make purposeful and more thoughtful choices. So, before your reflection meeting, here are a few things to try out. First, pick a key skill that students develop in your class. Go out and talk to three friends, family members, or colleagues who are not in education. Ask them how they use that skill in their everyday lives, at work, in the community, in their personal life. Next, try taking one step further out on the learning goals continuum of practice. Where we are on this continuum varies with context. You choose the context. You assess yourself and figure out what's the next step to try out. Be ready to talk about the result with your colleagues. Finally, Choose one of the attached resources to read, listen to, or watch. Hopefully, these will stimulate your thinking about why and how to incorporate ways to build purposeful learning. Be ready to share the resource and what you took away from it with your colleagues. Thanks for joining in today. I think a conversation about why is never wasted time. So thanks for taking the time for today.